probably ready to, to get going. So everybody can take their seats. My name is Alex Sunny, and I'm a, I'm a professor at McMaster University. And I'm really pleased and uh, honored to be here among you tonight on this uh, first workshop on community engagement and uh, community, community conversations. Pleased that everybody came here and braved the weather to, uh, to make it out. It's, uh, tonight we're, we're going to speak amongst each other, and I'm going to speak a little bit as well. And we'll have a chance to express our thoughts and ideas around what we think a good plan for civic engagement is, a good, good strategy, is good, good approaches to civic engagement are on the part of the city and on the part of engaged citizens. But before I speak and get the night rolling, uh, Mike Krakopoulos and Paul Johnson from the City of Hamilton would like to say a couple words. Thanks, Alex, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we won't keep it brief in terms of opening comments. We're here to uh, let Alex facilitate a conversation for us this evening. I do know that there are a few staff people from the City of Hamilton here, so I want to welcome them this evening. I also want to welcome uh, Councillor Farr from Ward 2. Uh, the Councillor has other business tonight. He's not going to be able to stay for the full three hours, but wanted to be here, and I appreciate that very much. And I know Nick Westall's here. Uh, just you just <laughs> I, I, I do know that you really thought we were playing pickup basketball tonight, and so I, 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 I know that well enough. Uh, Nick Westall is here from uh, Council Morales office, and Morales is known as Robert Fernandez, and Nick is very free to be here representing his office. And I also want to say uh, a word of welcome to a couple of people who are here from our neighborhood uh, planning teams in this community, and folks that have a great deal of experience engaging themselves as leaders in the community, but also being engaged in a process jointly with the city. And I know Steve Calverly is here from the South Sherman planning team. Steve, welcome. And Dave Stevens from uh, the Jamesville planning team, also the North End neighbors. So Dave, welcome. And if I've missed anybody else, I apologize. But some really good examples of engagement that are going on in our community, both resident-led as well as partnerships between uh, the city and, and the community. So we're here tonight to listen, to, to, to think about ways that we can uh, do our work better of in, engagement in this community. And you know what, in January, I think it was January the 7th, um, I stood up in front of a lot of people and had to apologize for a job not well done. Um, I'm a basketball referee and we kicked the call pretty badly. Councillor Farr knows all about kicking calls. I used to referee him in men's league. And, uh, he wasn't the best player all the time, but I wasn't always the best official. But in terms of engagement in January, uh, we made some mistakes. It wasn't just a mistake on Twitter, because that, in my mind, had we all been aware of what we were trying to accomplish together, wouldn't have been that big a deal. What was very clear to me is that we had no partnership in this. Unaware of what we were trying to accomplish, we had clearly done a lot of our thinking inside the four walls of, of City Hall. And I'm not apologizing entirely because there's lots of good work that went into the background to that. This was a major project. It wasn't to design a website. It wasn't to, to just have a couple of fancy things on a, on a page somewhere. It was much deeper than that. It was to be a conversation about what we do as a city, to talk about all the things that go into running a modern city, and to talk about the things that need to be done better. That's what we're going to relaunch in the fall. And that conversation is happening some months from now. And so I think the way that we're trying to structure this evening is to listen not only about how that process can be the best it can be, but all our processes the best they can be. So throughout the evening, if you want to chat to me one-on-one -on -one about uh, past things that have gone well, past things that have not gone well, I'm, I'm, I'm here to do that and pleased to do that. And I'm also here to say to you that we won't be perfect all the time. But I'm here to say to you that the team that I'm working with now, uh, we are committed, as I've been committed through the neighborhood project and everything else that I do, to work in partnerships so that we understand what we're doing together. So that when things don't go perfectly, we can stand up and say, that's not going so well, how do we fix it? And how do we fix it together? And we can also be clear on what our objectives and our goals are so that there isn't confusion along the way. And that starts tonight with your ideas and your concepts, and at the end of the evening, I'll also talk about some next steps 
that we hope will involve many of you if you're willing to put a bit of time and energy into this with us. Uh, I'll talk about some next steps and some tangible things that we're doing as a community as well. So I want to thank Alex for his participation this evening, particularly thank you for coming out and participating this evening, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for those eloquent words. Um, like I said, um, I'm a professor at McMaster University. I run the Master of Communications Management program. Uh, and it's a, a program where we talk about effective communication, effective communications management, where we talk about what it means to build communities with communities. Uh, so build communities with, with people who uh, want to participate with, between an organization and those communities. So what we're going to try to do tonight is, is something like that. So I thought I'd give you a roadmap for the evening. Uh, we're actually right on track, which is perfect. And uh, I thought I'd take a couple minutes to discuss the, the process. So what we're going to do, and I open it up to you to, uh, to give me feedback and provide ideas on how you see it going is basically I'm going to present some ideas around community building, around uh, the way other cities are, are doing civic engagement, both through social media and through traditional media, as well as through traditional communications channels, like town hall meetings, etc. And then uh, we're going to break out into, into groups, which you're already set up to do, given that we're sitting at tables. And uh, then I'll, I'll give some questions for you to answer. So if, if one person can kind of, kind of be the uh, um, designated writer, the secretary for each, for each table, that'd be awesome, that'd be great. So we're going to do that, I'll start with uh, a presentation on culture change, we're going to talk about what social media is, has done to community building, we're going to talk about what, how community building has evolved as well. After that, we're going we're gonna to have some questions and some breakout sessions where you get a chance to discuss amongst yourselves and take notes. I ask that you take, take good notes of what's being said because we're going to gather them, we're going to put them together and report back afterwards. So there'll be a, a, a chance to see uh, an outcome from the evening in terms of uh, what's been said and sort of what, what the global storyline is and what, what's been said amongst all the tables. So, so if, you, if you'd like to take notes on the, the large pieces of paper, for example, on the, on the boards, that would be no great. Just saying, make sure you make sure you keep the notes because we'll, we'll collect them at the end of the evening. After that, we'll talk about community building in a, in a second movement to the evening, and again, break out, have a conversation amongst ourselves, report back. Then after that, I'll turn it back to our friends Paul and Mike to have a conversation about possible future directions limitations on what, what can be done as well, you know, to keep it real. And then we'll just have a, a general discussion some, and some questions at the end and then wrap up. So uh, how does that process sound to everybody? Does that, does that work? Yeah? Yeah, pretty standard. You know, it's a straightforward community building, community exercise. So without further ado, why don't we get going? So let's talk culture change first. I, I like this quote from Jean Vanier. Um, he's a, some of you may know who he is. He's a uh, visionary in terms of the provision of group homes for people who have disabilities, uh, both cognitive and, and uh, physical ones. And what I like about Jean Vanier was that he built an entire movement around the idea of social networking before it was cool, hip, or strategic for that matter to talk about this, to talk or to use those buzzwords. What do I mean? He had, a, he had a moment in his life when he realized that community was what it was all about when it came to building effective group homes. How did it happen? It happened like this. When he was living in Paris, he was living with uh, people who had disabilities and, and, and made every effort to help them made every effort to, to help them, but, but perhaps in a, in a condescending fashion, maybe not overtly, but in a, in a fashion that uh, was you know, helping someone by, in a downwards direction. 
He had this epiphany after bonding with, with the people he was working with, where he suddenly realized, and this was his, his, his great insight, that in fact, at a specific moment, realized that they were changing him as much as he was changing them. And that in fact, building, it was in building community with them, setting up a relationship of equality, setting up an inclusive relationship, that success was gonna happen. And so he said to himself, you know, what this means is, a, is mutual transformation, right? So you can't just engage in an effort to communicate with the public and com communicate to them or help someone, but rather you help, help one another through communication. So I like this quote, life is a succession of crises and moments when we have to rediscover who we are and what we really want. And isn't that the truth in this moment of massive transformation of the way organizations and governments in particular are going to communicate with a citizenry that increasingly wants participation, increasingly wants authentic feeling and real engagement. You know, that can be perceived as something to be afraid of by many, by, by officials, by, by community members. It's, it's a, a new way of doing things. But it is the new way of doing things, and it's unavoidable. Um, we used to live in a broadcast culture where people spoke at one another. And you could have the idea that you're controlling the message. But in the culture we're stepping into, it's not a broadcast model at all. It's not a few people crafting a message and sending it out, others decoding it and sending feedback and there being a big lag. No, it's the opposite. Now, now it's conversational. And so the, the, the new model for governments to communicate with citizens is a dialogical one, a conversational one. And what that means is no longer having a gold standard of, of, you know, the old way of doing things, which is a mass communications way of doing things, which is, you know, a one-to-many, well-crafted, finely honed message, which is done sent out, but rather um, a constant conversation, right? And, and one that's facilitated by new technologies, including social media. So for me, change means opportunity, and really big time, especially in a place like Hamilton, in which the citizens are so engaged and love the city so much. It's funny, everything changed in 1995 with the advent of the World Wide Web. Our physical world grew a big, massive, new version of itself. And in the mid-2000s, this grew again with the advent of social media and the way of being a community. So what does that mean? Well. All of a sudden, everybody got thrown into the deep end of doing conversation, of being in constant conversation with one another. Everybody got thrown into the deep end of image, image making and maintaining an image. It was challenging. And if you think about it, it was so challenging that a lot of people kind of went the wrong way. And, you know, at one point, Eric Schmidt half jokingly asked, CEO of Google, half jokingly asked, uh, that an amnesty he put out for all the people who had, who had you know, gone a little overboard in, in how they were using social media in terms of self-disclosure and whatnot. Because, why do I bring up that example? Because it shows just how new this was for most people. The idea of maintaining an image, of maintaining a personal brand, if you want to use that, that terminology. So it was a big change. And it was also a big change for, for cities, big change for organizations. So what is social media? It's the world you already know, but that's been amplified by digital media, made conversational, as I just said, and moving at light speed. So, you know, whereas there used to be a, a long lag between communication and, and feedback, it's gone. The lag is, is gone. But is that so alien? It's not. It's back to the future. Because what it is, it's, it's back to conversation. Just as, just as while I'm speaking here, you're a step ahead of me, thinking ahead what I could possibly, how am I gonna finish my sentence? If we were actually talking, you'd be, we'd be finishing each other's sentences the way we do in conversation all the time. So that model, that interpersonal communication model between people, that conversational model is the new way of doing communications. But you know, it's a new way of thinking. Web experiences are a big part of us. So there are nodes and links that bring together 
your physical world interactions online. The website's really important in the social media world. We'll talk about that a bit later. Device-specific strategy. Think about this. We're moving into an internet of things. We're moving into an internet of things where actually our main interface to other people is through things. Our iPads, our, I our iPhones, Blackberries, the various Samsung devices, Android devices. It's not about computers anymore. It's not about screens that are they're all the same size. It's about variety. It's about appliances that are that are network and speak to us. It's all these different ways in which we interact with our environment and with the people around us. Search is crucial in a world like that because a lot of those screens are tiny. And when you have a small amount of real estate, what do you have to do? You have to get the search right. So what are some social media basics? Let's, let's just talk about what a phenomenon social media is first. Let's think about this. Look, radio took 38 years to get to 50 million users. Television about 13 years. The internet about four years. And the iPod about three years. So it's a you know, typical adoption cycle. Some of them really well marketed, like the iPod, due to the, the, the genius of Steve Jobs. Uh, but look what happened with Facebook. 200 million users in one year and over a billion users this year. That's something that's completely different. It's not a, a product rollout. It's not a new commodity. It's actually a whole new cultural space. And I don't mean to say that in, in, in as hyperbole, as exaggeration. It really is. When that many people, you know, you think about it, that's a huge number, one billion people, adopt a new way of forming community and, and speaking to one another. Something has actually profoundly changed in the culture. And it's affected the whole way we do business. It's affected the way we interact as, as people. It's affected our sense of self. All of that has been radically changed by this idea that we all interact, not only in the real world, we can, you know, we stub our toe and it kills, but also in the virtual world where we have an image that we construct. And often we can be two very different people in those different places. So, it's not only a question about self, self-transformation. It's also a, a, a question about transformational, it's our transformation of our economy and society. So social media is the greatest transformation of our culture, economy, and communication since the Industrial Revolution. Why? Why is this a comment that you hear echoing through, through uh, communications talks so often? Because the previous era was kicked off by the printing press. It let us standardize the message. It let us put the message together in packages that were universal. What social media does is it turns that on its head. It turns things, or it, it, it allows, it shatters the message, it fragments it. It makes the message shared among a whole bunch of people. So the idea of, of having control over what's said really challenging thing in the world of social media. In fact, almost impossible. We did, we, fact is, you never really had control over what people thought of you. And in a world of social media, you really don't have control. It's just that it's a lot more obvious. I like this idea from Harold Ennis. I always like to put a little theory in because I'm a professor. We have to do that. <laughs> if we don't do that, something's wrong with the evening. So, and that's, one of the things I love about communications is that the biggest theorists are Canadian. Which is kind of awesome. So, Harold Ennis, Canadian historian and economist, there's a library named after him at McMaster, because he's a McMaster student, uh, said new media creates struggles amongst groups of people, but also among types of knowledge. Okay? Think about that for a second. When you say something via uh, a letter, it has one meaning. Print has one, you know, put something in a book, and it used to be prestigious. No longer so much. Now, put something in a book, it's just one package. Now that might sound a little extreme, probably a lot of book lovers in the room. All true. But the fact of the matter is, books are just a package and a cumbersome one at that for most people. And that's why we see things like, uh, you know, Amazon, Kindle, and Kobo, and whatnot, absolutely taking over the book market, with more than 50% of sales. Uh, going, going to electronic, going straight to ebook. So, you know, what that means is a totally different way of thinking about knowledge. 
Because when it's in a book, it's stuck there. It's hard to edit it. You can't change it. When it's printed in a newspaper, it's, it's fixed. It's fixed in stone almost, right? To, to make a change, you have to make a correction the next day. That's a big deal. It's a challenge. So when you put that online, it becomes conversational. Just like in our everyday conversations. You say something, you think someone says something to you later on in the day, you change your mind. You alter what you, what you had already said and people, people cut you that slack because in conversation that's what happens. We're always converging on each other's opinions. We're always converging on each other's attitudes and beliefs. But in a print world, that can't happen because it's set in stone. So this, this means you have to redefine the concept of participation. McLuhan, another one of my, my favorites, a Canadian media guru, again, number two. Don't worry, all, the only theory of the night. Uh, he said something really profound, which is the medium is the message. Well, what did he mean? Basically, the way you say something and the channel through which you say it is as or more meaningful than what you actually say. So, if you write someone a letter, they're going to interpret your message one way. Let's say you're asking them to, to come to this session, and you write them a email, it's very formal. If you ask someone via social media, it's quite informal. It's like, it's like, it's like a shout out, a shout out. It's like, it's like um, tossing a, you know, just asking, shouting at somebody across a way, across a square to come and, and hang out with you. Send somebody an email, it's somewhere in between. And how seriously they'll take what you say depends on what channel you use to say it, what medium. That's the idea of the medium is the message. So when you're communicating via print, you, pr you craft the message, you think about it, you craft the ideas that are gonna go into it, you put it out in a book, in a newspaper, whatever, and people are expecting that. They're expecting a certain level of per per perfection. But when you move into a social media world, digital world, it's changeable. Things, things can move. Opinions can change. Facts can be corrected. And so, again, people start to expect more conversation. So what is social media anyways? It's a communication technology that permits you to build networks of friends, classify them along distant, different lines, and then catalog all this information. If I asked you, why you liked your friend, why, why you like your friends, you know, 20 years ago. You'd hear things like, they make me feel good. Uh, they make me feel good about myself. They, they, they reinforce my, my attitudes, whatever. You ask the same question to a heavy social media user and they give you laundry lists of traits and features. You know, they tell you what, the, what, what their friends uh, believe in, they tell you what movies they like, they tell you what, what, what political party they belong to, they tell you uh, where, those people, where they live, where they eat out, all this laundry list of traits and features. That's a total change. You know? It's a change from a hazy, impressionistic idea of, what, of our relationships to a really honed one. So what makes a medium social? Well, it facilitates human interaction. It facilitates the flow of user-generated content. I'm not, I'm not telling you, it's not rocket science here. One, it facilitates one-to-many communication, and it can be used at little to no cost. So what does all this say? Communi social media is about participation. It's an inclusive medium. It's about instant gratification in, in conversation and communication. So what's, what, what is there that's similar and different between social and traditional media? Well, what they have in common is they both contain messages. Okay? Absolutely. All communication contains messages. They both use a channel. Electronic channel versus a physical channel. Newspaper is available physically, it's available electronically. But what are the unique properties of social media? Three things. Permanent social interface. It's always there for you to go and interact with other people through it. Like Facebook, it just doesn't poof, disappear. It's really bad for business if it does that. Permanent history of interactions. People like to know that, that they can track all their, all their conversations. And this is paradoxical, because we're talking about back to the future, right? Back to an age of conversation. But conversation relies on forgiveness and forgetfulness. 
right? You say something, it angers someone else, you stay friends with them three days later because you can't really remember what they said. We remember a small sliver of everything we've heard in our lives, of our experiences. But what social media gives is a permanent history of interactions. And finally, it's accessible, immediate, and changeable. So it's interesting. It's, it's, it's an unforgiving conversational medium, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, one of my friends uh, who was speaking at uh, the International Association for Business Communicators earlier this week, Dan Tish, put it really well. He said, never has the news cycle been shorter, and never has the effects of news been more permanent. Interesting. So, a couple last points. Personal social networking. What is happening with this? So when you have Facebook or Google Plus or other technologies like that, what's going on when people build community that way? When, you, when you're putting your friends list together, when you're friending other people, when you're joining with them, when you're joining socially with them electronically, what does that mean? Well, basically what it means is an extension of our city is being built parallel to the one that exists, that we know in our everyday lives. But it's one that's shaped by participation. And it's co-constructed and activated by the people that are involved. Here's what's interesting about that. Do you guys think, well, it's the same thing in, in, in the real world, right? Because that's what happens. Yes. But the difference here is that it's all about our interactions. So social media, whether it's Facebook or Google+, actually is a world of words, images, and movement. So it's a world of our own creation, where our perceptions of the city, our perceptions of everyday life, are, are, are brought to the forefront. Think about this. You just, you just have to go down that hammock hashtag. I, I, I was doing this for the last couple of weeks, just pulling down interesting ideas, because I had had a conversation with somebody who brought this out to me. He said, you know, it's amazing you get this sense of the city when uh, you just pay attention. And I've seen these beautiful images and seeing, you know, reading people's, you know, touching stories or moments of their lives, fragments, shards of their lives that are immortalized in this constant flow. And I was thinking to myself, what's going on here? And I was thinking, what it is, it's, a, it's people creating this extension of the city into, into the virtual world, right? It's a powerful thing that's happening. You know, they're capturing through their eyes, which would normally have just been everyday storytelling. It would have been just me shooting a breeze with you over a coffee or, or a pint or whatever. But what it is now is, you know, I'm taking a moment and I'm communicating with everyone else, right? It's the poetry of everyday life is really what it is, you know? And it's, but not expressed in some highfalutin artistic fashion, in simple language. It's really the poetry of the everyday. And it's something that's built by everybody together. Amazing, powerful thing, because it makes the city bigger, right? It makes the city much larger. So what's the key? One of the keys to this is microblogging, Twitter. And what does Twitter do? It allows you to transfer short bursts of information, and it allows users to disseminate their tweets, the, the tweets of others. So three years ago, Twitter had 70, approximately 75 million users, okay? Successful, great. Actually successful beyond the dreams of the founders, I believe. Now, over 500 million. It's become the newswire for a lot of people. A very selective one at that. It's like a community newswire. It's become the opinion feed. I did a, had made an interesting experiment with my students this year informal and asked. So how many of you consider yourself fairly informed? And these are communication students, so they're pretty informed. Most of them put up their hand, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an informed person. And I said, okay, well, you know, where do you get your information? And you know, they named reporters, local reporters, national reporters, etc. Then I said, okay, that's great. So what, 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 what organizations are these reporters affiliated to? Not a clue, right? What they were doing was interacting with the reporters or journalists or editorialists as people, right? And that's when an organization becomes on Twitter, it becomes a person, it becomes personified. You interact with it as if it's a person that you're talking to. So you think, oh, well, you know, I'm talking to my friend, the city of Hamilton, you know? 
And that, that, that's the way that relationship's built. And that's a very different relationship than I'm receiving a press release or I'm being communicated to through a medium like a newspaper or through the television. Interesting, it's totally different. It's a different feel and it's a very powerful way of receiving a message. What's the near future? Geotagging, we're going to see a couple of examples from the city of Calgary and Toronto of this stuff, so I'll put some pictures up soon. Don't worry, we're almost done with the boring text. Uh, interactive maps, people love maps. I love finding myself on maps. I was one of those weird kids where I sat there and I'd trace out all the places I want to go to and go, oh, cool, that's how you get from Sault Ste. Marie to Toronto, or, or you know, where, where I grew up in King City, north of Toronto, and oh, that's how I get to, to Perry Sound, and, you know, and I remember, swimming lengths in the pool and, and, and tracing out how far I'd got you know, on, on a map and you know, eventually getting to these destinations. Amazing, right? This was when it was just paper and markers. Right? What Google Maps and other geolocation services like that do is it opens up the same wonderment at a place, like knowing the boundaries of where you live um, and makes them social. That's an amazingly powerful thing. Again, think about it. Make, it makes the city bigger. Okay? And geotagging services lets you drop a pin somewhere on that map and say, this, was, this place was special for me. It was important. And what a, what a, again, what a powerful way to interact with your government, or interact with, with uh, the municipality. Like I said again, these services make the city bigger. Finally, the website. Shift up of your social feeds. Think about that. A website can become the hub for your social feeds. It can become an open data or knowledge repository. Why? Because it has to in the long run. Right? It really has to. Because we're moving towards that in the future. We're moving towards more openness. We're moving towards more inclusion. We're moving towards more access to data. Does that mean that people will actually access the data? It's up to them to decide. But again, there's opportunity here. Because there's a whole wave of new communications startups in every, that are you know, going to be available in every, or going to be built in every city, interpreting all of this data. All these data, which will suddenly be available. Think about it, visualizations, amplifying and, and augmenting services, providing services uh, that nobody's thought of yet. Amazing, powerful, powerful economic engine, not only one for civic engagement. And that I mean that's one of the punchlines from tonight, right? Is that it, communication isn't just about communication anymore, it's also about business, it's also about economic prosperity. It's also about working together to build a community that generates knowledge as, as a commodity, knowledge as, as, as a product. Knowledge mobilization engine, you, can, you take the ideas that people are building and you, and you distribute them. And finally, an, an engagement engine. If your website is a mashup of your social feeds, and guess what? It's open for engagement, it's open for business that way. Last, last idea is mobility. Mobility is key to understanding how people are gonna use uh, social media and other, and when I say social media, we're at a very primitive stage right now, Twitter, Facebook, really rudimentary. You know, it's like, it's like the Model T Ford, really, compared to what's coming. That internet of things I was talking about, right? Um, smartphones and multiple screens are changing the way we interact with information. I had this experience. I went to a friend's house for dinner, and I was going to hang out with his family. And there was a, you know, they were they were using the giant screen, maybe a big, you know, whatever it was, 38 or 40 inch screen that was hanging on the wall, to interact with the internet. And sites look beautiful on that big of a screen. They look awesome because it's you've got so much real estate to work with. Anything looks beautiful on that, right? But then, when it was time to go grocery shopping, pick up, pick a few things up, it became all about the Blackberry and the iPhone. Totally different ballgame. A world of frustration. A world of irritation. Right? Because all of a sudden, it was slow. The sites couldn't load up. You couldn't, your finger was too big for, for, for the screen to be able to hit the tiny boxes. Real challenge. So smartphones and multiple screens are changing, changing a technology and communication going into the future. And this is the future. Mobility is the future of communication. Finally, search is central to mobile computing again, like I said earlier, because if you, if you don't have effective search on a small screen, 
the user experience is, is, is really horrible. Because it, then, then it becomes actually hunting and pecking through screen after screen, effective search and things like that. So now, what's the kicker? Social media only works if it's a cat catalyst for getting people to act in the physical world to build community. So, any strategy has to combine traditional means like this, town halls, meeting people in the everyday world, communicating through print, press releases, um, all those traditional ways of engaging. Speeches, of course. In fact, speeches become even more powerful in this world because it's such a rhetoric-oriented world. And social media has to unite with those things. So if you're going to build community, you have to build it virtually and in the real world. And if you don't do that, um, you end up having two solitudes. Or you end up having a small group of people who participate in one, and a small group of people who participate in the other. Not what you want. You want maximum participation on both sides. So let's talk about a couple of examples. Let's look at the city of Calgary. They've done amazing things, absolutely amazing things in terms of citizen engagement and, and, and use not only of social media, but real world communication and just mashing the two up, colliding those two things. I'm going to look at a couple of examples, Cut Red Tape, e-services, and their little food truck program. What they've also done is they've encouraged independent voices to participate in the conversation. So, you, you know, the, the civiccamp.org and Enough for All, two, two uh, community-led um, efforts to make Calgary a, a better, richer, more compassionate, happier place. So, if you look at their Transforming Government website, it's pretty amazing. They've got, um, it's a little small here, but that's, I hope you can kind of see it. Uh, a whole bunch of different projects that they're rolling out. And they're asked, they ask themselves, what is transforming government? And so it's around a few key ideas, which you can't see, but I'll read them out. Transparency, accountability, civic engagement, innovation, citizen orientation, and sustainability. Key elements, key principles that drive their, their, their real world and social media, civic engagement program. So let's look at the Cut Red Tape project. You know, it's the idea that people can have input on transforming government. So neat idea. Communicate ways in which you think things can be improved. Redundant forms, redundant processes. Um, licenses and regulations that are difficult to, to police or, or, or difficult for people to gain access to. You know, it's kind of low-hanging fruit, but it's something that's really accessible. It's an idea that, that makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, they make it available. They, they say what the total savings were to the city. You know? Great idea. They have an interactive map. You can get anywhere you want in the virtual Calgary by figuring, by, by, by pointing and clicking. And, you know, what that does is, that, again, it makes the city bigger for people. It makes the city the boundaries of the city more expansive. And so, you know, I've got one here, it's the city, Calgary City Hall Municipal Complex, there it is. You click on any one of these things and it tells you what's behind them. They have a council innovation fund. If um, you have an idea and you get a councillor to sponsor it, there's money available to promote that idea and to, to make change, to change a process, to add value. It's an engaging, inclusive way to spend a little money and to crowdsource ideas. The use of Facebook is pretty amazing. If you look at it, they have all their social feeds available through Facebook, so their Facebook is pretty comprehensive. They use Facebook as a sort of homepage to complement the city's homepage. And just lots of information with one voice from the city. So a really unified voice providing a lot of information in it, and a lot of interactivity. And you look at the number of likes, 26,000 likes and 20, 23,000 people talking about it. Pretty impressive. Okay. And you know, they have updates and large numbers of people commenting on the updates. What's neat about it though, unified approach, single voice. They've built the history of the city into the Facebook timeline. So it's kind of fun. 
You know, Calgary's first fire hall was built, 1887. What else happened in 1887? Anybody know? A certain university was founded. <laughs> yep, McMaster. So, proud moment. Thought I'd highlight it. Um, and uh, in, you know, in 1894, Calgary's incorporated as a city. And it goes through everything that way, through the timeline. You know, it's making the real city, making the real city's history available to the public, and look, available for comment as well. You know, people sharing, people commenting possibly. I mean, not a lot of comments on the incorporation of the city, but nonetheless, it's available, it's there. I'm sure there's per one person who's gonna eventually say, yeah, yeah I was there, oh, not, yeah. Um, their Twitter feed is available through the Facebook page too. You know, again, this idea of kind of a one-stop shop. And uh, if you were looking today, I tried to pick it out from today, uh, a lot of, all talk about the, the outcomes and the devastation wrought by the flood, right? But what, I, I've been following the City of Calgary's social media efforts over the last week, and it's been phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal, the pushing out of information about, about the flood, citizen engagement, you know, and, and, and facilitating citizens communicating to one another as well. You know, just amazing. YouTube. Tons, tons, tons of video available, um, again, via the Facebook site. Smart. It's connected. It's a hop, skip, and a jump over to the other parts of, of, of the city's uh, virtual presence. Really great. And what you're seeing through all this is that it's connecting the virtual world to the real world. Because all of these things are, are moments in history pinpointing uh, things that happen in the community, real world, uh, as we saw earlier with the, with the interactive map, real world places that you can go visit. In this case, real world footage, this is all again flood related, but raw, raw media footage available to the public. It's the real world of people's fears and dreams and interactions put onto the virtual world. It's that mapping of traditional ways of communicating via this electronic medium. Amazing. And again, you know, interactive map on Facebook as well. So you can, again, trace the history of the city. Uh, events. They had this three, the, the mayor's office launched, you know, three things. What are three things you can do, or you would like to do, to, or you would, you would like to see done that would improve the city? And they put up a page about it, they ran real world events. And the real world events were mirrored on the internet. So, I mean, in kind of a simple but visionary move, they crowdsourced a whole bunch of excellent ideas about how to transform the city. And it was amazing. I, I, I read examples of seven-year-old kids saying that, you know, that, that, that uh, they were doing school projects and, and, and would, would like the city's help, and there was interaction that way, all the way up to, to much more serious, and, and, and uh, well, nothing's more serious than someone's school project, of course, but, um, you know, uh, you know, things that affect everyday life, like potholes, streets, the, the, um, the whole civic engagement strategies for neighborhoods, etc. that people are suggesting, right? Amazing. Again, simple. The best ideas for community building are simple ideas. And like I said, engagement with um, the third sector, with, with, with NGOs and, and, and not-for-profits, right? Civic camp. Um, the Mayor's Engagement com Committee, which launched this Three Things for Calgary campaign, included the Civic Camp people on, 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 on the board, on the, on, on the committee. And it made the citizen group an integrated partner in, in, in community change, right? And in community development. Amazing. And again, both organizations have a virtual presence and a real world presence. Another example, Enough for All, Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative, right? Citizen driven, community driven idea, partnered with the city openly. Pretty powerful thing. The, you know, eliminate poverty, eliminate homelessness in Calgary in 10 years is one of the goals, you know, reduce poverty radically in Calgary. And it's, it's you know, again, crowdsourcing the idea. To, and, then, and then, you know, having, having the city and citizens work together to make things real. Amazing. 
City of Toronto, opposite type of example. Very, again, lots of citizen engagement, powerful, but in a different way. And we'll talk about this really briefly here. So you go to their website, and they have consultation, learning guides, city council, access to council, and social media available. How do they do things differently? They are less integrated. So this model um, is a lot more about a lot of different feeds attached to different departments and different projects. Um, they do something that I thought was really cool. The briefing book that new counselors receive, and new staffers, they actually put it online. Made it available for anybody. Very good. You know, open. How many people read it? I don't know. Two or three, maybe? You know, who knows, right? But the fact is, it's there, right? Public consultations. The idea of, you know, street needs. And they have so many of these where they've built a virtual face for their, for their real world public consultations. And it's powerful. It's linking the virtual world with the real world again. In this one, it's, it's, you know, volunteer today for Toronto's homelessness survey and census. Again, you know, it's a social justice oriented, crowdsourced idea. Right? Get, get people involved. And you can go and look at this giant list of public consultations that they offer. And it's all there. It's all, it's simple. Again, like I said, it's not, it's not a question of having something aesthetically perfect or, or or uh, you know, you know, high art. It's about accessibility, right? It's about making the information available, making it interactive. So everything's up there, and you can interact. You can interact with it different ways. And I was pretty impressed to see that they too were using the idea of interactive maps. I'm a huge fan of interactive maps. I've seen them work magic, you know, in, in, in campaigns and in um, efforts to really bring the geography of a place to life in light of a campaign. Because there's nothing quite like seeing where something happened. It's magical. It has its own idea. It has its own magic. Because it's, it's, it's our imagination of going there. It calls in all these different ideas of travel, of, of kinship with something that's different from you. It's pretty amazing. They put all their learning guides on. And again, lots of use of video. Useful. Simple, but useful. What does video do? It, oh, it, it breaks the stranglehold that print has always had. Right? Because print leaves the majority of the population out. Sure, everybody can read, but a lot of people really dislike reading. A lot of people really feel uncomfortable reading and processing information. You know? So video makes communicating, learning, or, or new ideas interpersonal. It brings in that majority of, inter of, of uh, non-verbal communication brings a greater slice of that nonverbal communication back into the picture when you're communicating. So video is a really interactive thing. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to have high production values. It's a simple thing. If you watch these, they're really homespun. But they're, but they're effective. They have Open City Council. So, you know, it's, it's basically they, they put all the briefing notes and, and, and uh, sorry, uh, they, they put all, all the reports. They put legislative processes. They put... Uh, uh, websites for meetings, agendas, and minutes, everything available online, right? In a, in a really simple, easy to navigate way. Now, here's where it really differs in the city of Calgary. Social media at, in, in the city of Toronto is pretty desperate. So have a look at this. Look at all the Twitter accounts. Tons and tons of Twitter accounts. RSS feeds, all the different Facebook pages. It's a challenging model to, to manage. Uh, it's a challenging model in which for people to interact with as well because uh, when you have that much choice it really puts the burden on the um, citizen to make the right choices that you interact with right when you have more of a one-stop shop a little bit easier to manage right so while this has its strengths because each one of these uh, Twitter accounts oh there's Rob for each one of these Twitter accounts uh, has uh, its own following, its own community, um, the, the, the challenge is more in managing it. They have a couple of key 
initiatives, like the Feeling Congested Initiative, talking about the, the, the how to improve congestion in the city. And again, you see public meetings, social media interactions, video, there's an introductory video, um, that are all about letting people have their say, letting them, letting them in on the process, ripping the front wall off. Eglinton Connect is another example. Building community through um, a clever website, clever, clever, clever web, uh, social feeds. So, that being said, let's, now it's the, that's the end of me talking for, for a little bit, but let's take a minute and let's ask ourselves a few questions. And if you could kind of focus in on your group, I'll, I'll introduce some questions. I'd like you to, to take the next few minutes to ask yourselves, what does social media and traditional communications mean um, to you in your real world life? What, is, what does that combination mean? How, how does the combination of social media and traditional communications help you actually be more uh, engaged as a resident? What impressed you most about the Hamilton and Calgary examples? What elements of the Hamilton and Calgary examples do you think would be most, of most good in Hamilton? Toronto and Calgary examples, sorry. And what is one way that you think that social media could be used to amplify traditional ways of learning about government services? So let's take a few minutes and actually have that conversation. I'm just going to circulate around. And, um, yeah. So what are we trying to get out of this at the end? Like, what's the takeaway? Is the city supposed to take this information and do something with it? Like, what's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, we're going to uh, take all the information at the end of it, and we're going to produce a, a report of, of everything that's been said and suggested, right? And then probably have another meeting where, where we carry the conversation forward. So, yeah, report back and, and uh, use the information quickly. Yeah. Great. So, let's get rolling. Yeah. All right, let's do that. Like I said, So 
more communication doesn't necessarily mean better communication, and there was concern for that. But as well, on the other side of that is a, a number of examples about how people communicate with one another over issues that matter. They've never met each other face to face, and it really goes somewhere, and eventually you do run into those people in a community environment. So we talked about that kind of bit as well. And we talked about examples of how to make things happen by posting. And um, Steve here had a really good example of a, of a very old building that was taken down and everything happened fairly quickly. So those are our examples. That's great. Great, thank you very much. So let's move on over here. This is going to be Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, we uh, had a pretty good conversation. It sort of broke away from the questions. It started a great dialogue. Um, we were sort of talking about access information and how not everyone goes on the same channels. We're aware of the channels. We just might not use them. And um, we're trying to make ways to, to communicate the message to everyone. So, I don't know if we can find solutions, but we're certainly talking about it and sharing it. I can't read it. Can you read it for us? No. Okay. So, we want more input to the process of agenda. We want a more transparent government. We want a clear information. Um, there's a challenge of engaging citizens, regardless of media. And um, we want to know who does what. We want to know who to talk to. When, who has the information? We want to know how to access them. So, via directory or profiles on Facebook, we, just, we want to know where to direct our questions to. Great. Is that just now we're going to slightly different focus? So, we'll move over here. Let's make a report. Over here. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, so, in many ways, we've reflected some of the things that have been talked about already. Um, some of the things we value were that um, we can, can participate in conversations that we, that we wouldn't normally be able to because there's access in a, in a timely way, it's connected 24-7. Um, however, uh, people express concerns about privacy and feel that um, conversation may be limited because it is a uh, permanent record and that doesn't lead to true conversation. Um, we uh, talked somewhat about um, whether the engagement needs to be two-way, um, whether uh, there needs to be, uh, uh, whether it can just be posting. Um, and, um, that we need to be careful about that we have the right medium and that we have many mediums because everyone doesn't have access to every medium or doesn't use every medium. And um, we did talk a bit about uh, the Calgary versus Toronto model of multiple Twitter accounts versus a single one. And, um, and we didn't have any resolution there. There was value in, in both ways, but I think if we viewed the we tended towards the Calgary model and viewed it somewhat like the uh, the uh, traditional phone uh, receptionist that they can take the, the message but need to consult with the, the experts and have uh, have further conversation with, with uh, the experts in the, the city. Thank you very much. And over here. And now um, I think the discussion went quickly from not so much uh, is the Calgary way of doing social media better than the Toronto way. We discussed how the way that Calgary is doing it is more of an integrated strategy. So all of um, the way that they look and sound and feel will be the same on the phone. If you're talking to the mayor, if the mayor was on, um, the news that night, or if you were talking on Twitter. Whereas in Toronto, 
those examples that all feel very disjointed. And the results of that, I guess, are our plan protections. So cavalry looks like they're, they're working together towards the same goal, like they're friendly and collaborative, hip and with it. And Toronto looks like they don't know where they're going, so they're never going to get there. And what a mess. And so, the question that we were left at our table was, is asking how we do social media, the right question to be asked, and should we be asking at a leadership level, at a council level, at a you know, municipal government level, who are we? What do we want to, what do we want our brand to be? What do we want others to think of us? And then start from there, and then answer to, well, how should we conduct ourselves on social media? We'll just fall out naturally from that. So really start from the bottom up. Thanks, Adam. So we had a really good chat with our group. Uh, there's a really cool guy in our group that's left, uh, named Matt, and he was the uh, co-chair of the Beasley Neighborhood Association. So we kind of actually had a lot of chat about their activities, but um, a couple of the most pertinent points that I think came out to the group, um, one was um, the necessity of um, using social media as a group to find out what's going on and finding collaborative solutions together. That's something that everyone very much felt that they did in different ways in their life and Beasley Neighborhood Association was one way of doing that. Um, another was the need though to keep um, our strategies inclusive of all by not just relying on social media. So I found it really amazing that Beasley Neighborhood Association has a mechanism to call seniors in the neighborhood that aren't on computers and get them to come out to events. And there was really a, an emphasis on that face-to-face -face really grounds out social media, and we all agreed that we did that. Tonight's a, actually a great example. Um, and then lastly, I think, um, I think just the need for everyone to be committed to keeping the discourse civil. So uh, at the Beasley Neighborhood Association, again, I don't know anything about it, I'm speaking really for Matt, but his group would, if there's conflict, they need to talk about it. So it's not a mudslinging event online, it's a let's actually work together to, to fix this together. So I, I thought it was a great example, and that group's do a lot of credit. So, um, in terms of the models, Calvary just seemed really user friendly, and we talked a lot, Heather was talking about going to see what was happening in her hometown, and everything was laid out really easy, centralized, so we liked that as well. Thank you very much. More, more insightful commentary. Hi. Uh, we began by acknowledging that social media has helped all of us, those of us who have resulted us to say, um, establish relationships. And then we talked about triggered in part by the questions asked, but not entirely. Um, that obviously the, the, the foundation is based on information, but then we talked about one of the things that we seem to like about the Calgary example, based on what we could discern, is that there's, quote, an identifiable path forward. Uh, there's also identifiable, therefore identifiable information. It's kind of, it seems easier, almost intuitive, but again, we were just looking at slides. Um, the next I, there were four I's that we sort of talked about. Um, the next one was integrated, and that, uh, there really was a desire to ensure that there was true integration with social media and departments and citizens. Uh, the third I was interactivity. And by that we, we talked about uh, we not only know the city, whose information we perhaps have difficulty accessing now, and that would be good, but also that the city knows us, which we do not think is happening to the extent that it could be facilitated by this kind of, kind of thing. So gathering information from citizens, not just making sure the citizens can find out when their garbage is collected, which, uh, by the way, all of us have faced. So it's not that that's irrelevant, it's quite relevant. And the last item we got a chance to talk about was making it inclusive, um, which is a tough one, because while there was obviously 
uh, and Alex, you've shared uh, stats with me in terms of you know, who, who are most likely to use social media or at least to be online. Uh, it's slightly counter, well, at least I found it slightly counterintuitive. Uh, but in terms of inclusivity, how do we make sure that this isn't just uh, you know, good for the usual suspects, but in fact, broader? Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I think to pick up on, on what some of the other groups said, we had a very good conversation about the need for uh, mixing and having a good mix between social media and traditional media, uh, and that the dialogue really needs to be two-way. Um, and as, as Franz mentioned, that listening is important, we won't do enough listening. Uh, and that this um, initiative tonight is probably a good step in that direction. He did mention the fact that we've got a retirement and a, and a senior tsunami. So how do we tap into that group of people? And I know there are some metrics that you shared uh, about who are the users of social media, but uh, we had a good conversation on how to really get creative as, as government, as institutions, uh, in terms of reaching out to different individuals, different groups, um, and, and, and doing some of the uh, tried and tested ways of getting out there uh, Franz had mentioned things like, uh, you know, let's go to Rotaries, let's get out there and talk to community groups, uh, trade unions, so that uh, we kind of mix the social media with, with some of the traditional and really build those relationships. That's great, thank you very much. So, a, a really broad range of ideas. It's, as always in these kinds of events, each table kind of involves its own set of priorities and its own set of things that, that concern it. So, we had everything from um, the idea of maintaining a balance between the virtual world and the real world, to the idea of in inclusion, integrity, um, and um, the idea that, that nobody should be excluded, you know, to, to some interesting specific you know, ideas around, you know, the use of, you know, something as simple as a phone tree, uh, as was mentioned about the, the Beasley neighborhood, to, to reach people who actually can't be reached in regular ways. These are all forms of community building, and they're all forms of, um, of, 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 of a community pulling together with its government to uh, make the city bigger and to make it more relevant and meaningful for the, for the folks involved. So, really, really powerful ideas. The idea, too, about caution and about is the, is, is the culture ready to power, or powerful indeed. And finally, the, uh, the, the one thought that actually, you know, establishing a mission, vision, and values, and, and, and establishing a, a, a brand idea, uh, and then having strategies fall out of that. And I think it tied to the, to the idea of, you know, deliverables and, and process. Um, that we heard in our, our, our second last intervention uh, was really powerful as well. So we really cover, covered the gamut of different ways of thinking about community building using, using traditional and social media. And actually that leads us really nicely into our next segment, which is about community building indeed. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about community building. What is this strange beast? And, and because you think to yourself, well, we all live in communities. It's obvious, right? I mean, we all know what that is. But actually, it's not so obvious. Because communities are things that are very different depending on whether they're built socially, whether, whether they're, uh, sorry, via digital communications, whether they're built in the real world, whether they're communities that transcend both. And uh, I'm going to, I make reference to a, a manual for community ma management, community building, that I think is the absolute, absolute, uh, Bible for this sort of thing. It's by John O'Bacon. You can actually download it for free from his own website. It's called the, the Art of Community Online. And his book is called The Art of Community, second edition. It's a little bit techy. He actually um, focuses a lot on uh, building, oh, sorry, sorry uh, open source computing. So building and big programming projects by getting a lot of people to participate in their free time, which is a really challenging thing to do. And in fact, the author, John O'Bacon, is so, so successful that uh, his particular um, soft, you know, operating system environment, called, it's called uh, Ubuntu Linux, ended up being sort of this, one of the, the world standards, mostly because he was able to, to, to get it built in an effective fashion by building community and managing it. So let's look at a little bit of his wisdom, and then we'll, we'll, we'll ask, I'll ask you a few more questions. So, 
We live in an era of participation. Not that we ever didn't. We always did live in an era of participation. But we live in an era of participation now where people want to get involved. Um, traditional markers of belonging in society are changing. Families are less likely to be cohesive. A large proportion of the population is divorced or living alone. A large proportion of the population um, chooses to have a family uh, with only one parent, you know. So we live in a, in, a, in a world of diversity where we look for belonging in ways that are up, very different from the traditional sense of belonging to your family, belonging to your church, belonging to, you, to your culture. We live in a fragmented, multicultural society, right? Uh, it's, it's cohesive, it's coherent. The society makes sense, but it only makes sense in the mosaic of its fragments. So what does that mean? It means something really specific for building community and building belonging. Because what it means is that a lot of individuals are looking for ways to participate, looking for ways to find meaning in their lives through belonging to something. And it's an unprecedented place, society. We've never been here before because we've never had so many people so alone. And I don't mean that in a negative fashion. Because a lot of people are living this as a, as a, as a moment of personal liberation, right, or personal freedom. Uh, but the fact is that a lot of people are seeking belonging in non-traditional ways. So, how do you get, how do you hone into that? How do you get everybody who is seeking that sense of belonging, that, that feeling of place, right? And how do you activate them? Well, you have to engage them. Because the civic space that they want to belong to is one that they co-construct with the city. It's participatory uh, government. It's, it's constant communication. It's, you know, you look at this with management. Um, somebody told me a funny joke a few, a few weeks ago. He said, it in a, uh, as a Gen Xer, which is what I am too, uh, you don't really like to be managed, right? So, so someone, someone comes and they say, they say, okay, we're gonna do an annual review. You go through the annual review, you say, well, thank you very much. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna forget all about that and move on, right? Uh, but if you look at the new generation of millennials, totally different, right? They love being managed, right? We, re re reporting is, 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 and constant conversation is important, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, so people that, uh, work with me at the university, like to have constant contact, constant feedback, right, young, uh, young people. So, it's funny, we live in, an, in a high touch moment, and one that I think is only going to become more high touch as we move forward. So that means that you have to create those experiences for folks, you have to make space for them in your life, you have to make space for communicating the why behind something that the city's doing, not only the what, right? Uh, you have to communicate and include people in that why. So, and you know, you think to yourself at first, that's daunting, it's, 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 uh, it's an annoying thing, it could be frustrating, and even from the citizen perspective, oh, same thing, daunting, annoying, frustrating, but actually, no, it's, it's, a, it's a form of more direct democracy, right? It's a form of more inclusion, and you know, it's not an option, it's not a choice, right? We are moving towards more community-based management, particularly at the, at, at the municipal level, and more co-construction of civic spaces with the public and the city together. It's unavoidable, right? It might not happen tomorrow, might not happen a month from now, might not happen six months from now, might not happen a year from now, but it is inevitable that it will happen, right? The question is how how to, how to get there. And the process, when you build relationships and build community, is super important. You know that because any time you try to build a personal relationship with someone else, and you've messed it up by being overbearing, or by not giving them, not disclosing information to their person, or, um, or uh, trying to control them, all of those things lead to, to stagnation or failure of those relationships. It makes, makes people profoundly uncomfortable with you when you exhibit those, those bad relationship behaviors, right? And remember what I said earlier in the night? We're moving away from that broadcast model. 
absolutely. Print is dead in terms of its, its, its ownership of our imagination. We're in this conversational, interpersonal world. So the standards that we apply to building a relationship with one another in our everyday lives are the standards that the citizens are going to expect from, from government, from corporations, from, from organizations that they, that they interact with. Right? And it's that conversation, it's that high-touch emotional connection right? that, that transcends um, simple provision of services or simple um, communication of facts. And that's the new world we're heading to. Are we there now? No. We're getting there. Will we be there a year from now? We'll be closer. God knows how much closer, but we'll be closer. Five years from now, we might be there. Who knows? I'm just, it's like shooting a, uh, you know, uh, it's like shooting a dart into the, it's like, actually, you know what it's like? It's like, it's like casting an arrow into the future, right? And, and seeing where it lands and having it tied to where you are now. The actions you do now, the ideas you discuss now, the things you, you share with one another, impact the future in a community building model. In a way that an old structural top-down model, they didn't. Because quite frankly, you gave input in an old structural top-down model, it was noted and forgotten. Right? In a community-oriented model, literally, when you participate, you co-construct a piece of that city. Now, you're going to say that's idealistic. Sure, it's idealistic. But again, we're idealists. Each and every one of us is, even if you consider yourself a cynic or a realist or whatever. You know, the fact is we all, we all wake up in the morning because we, we think of how things ought to be. We think of how things, how we want them to be. So this means openness about data, means openness about processes, and it means openness about service delivery. And if you look at open data models, cities that have, that have taken open data seriously, or if you look at um, cities that have crowdsourced improvement to, 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 to services by asking the community to participate, um, it's always good. People are always happier. It's a, a win-win. But the question is getting there the right way, right? Starting uh, with a conversation and then maintaining and sustaining that conversation until you get to the end point of, these, of this kind of openness, right? It's not just about saying, oh, we're throwing open the doors tonight. It's openness time. We're open for, we're open for openness business. It doesn't work that way, right? All right. What is, what, is, what is community built around? It's built around the concept of social capital. Um, here's an interesting stat for you from the business world. 1970s, late 70s, over 80% of market value tied to um, tangibles, assets, balance sheet, etc. Okay? Um, 2009, over 80% market value, publicly traded corporations, tied to non-intangibles, reputation mostly, right? Powerful thing. Total change, right? Uh, why? Because we've had a shift in perception, right? A shift from a print-based structured society to an oral conversational society where persuasion, rhetoric, and whatnot weigh heavily. Reputation. What do you have in a, in a society like that that makes you, makes you someone that's worth listening to? Your credibility, your reputation, right? So, what is credibility and reputation based on? It's based on belief. Communities are based on belief. How do you build that in a tangible way that's measurable with outcomes? Well, you can measure social capital. It's the collective family of positive interactions between two or more people. And you can measure this via social media, you can measure it via surveys, you can measure it, um, you can really easily measure it via digital communication, because like I said, there's that permanent history of interactions. But really, social capital is the currency of the reputation economy, if you want to think about it that way. Interesting. People want to get involved and active because they want to belong. You know, uh, if you look at one of the great motivators for folks now to when they purchase things or when they join a group, and you ask them, you, see, you know, in many campaigns that I've participated with, uh, and you say, so why, why are you why are you volunteering? Why are you part of this? And so many times people will tell you that it's a sort of escape from loneliness. Now, 
Is that a bad thing? Again, I don't think so. I think we're in, we're in, a, we're in, we're in a culture of, of individuals now, right? Very different from 50, 60 years ago, where it was a culture of families, communities, etc. So, if you're in a, in, in a society where, where people are very individualistic, there's still a search for belonging, there's still a search for community, but those communities are more abstract. They're volunteer communities. They're um, political participation, you know, communities of political participation, communities of social action, communities of act, personal activation around a brand. So people are seeking meanings in places other than their traditional places where you seek the sought meaning. So belonging is, depending on a, is, is dependent on a strong social economy. If you feel you're gaining social capital by participating in a civic engagement strategy, you're going to feel good about living in that city. And whether it's the virtual city, where you're participating and thinking, I'm having my voice heard, I'm adding to the conversation, I'm shaping policy. Or whether it's the real world interactions, cleaning up uh, neighborhoods uh, in, in terms of environmental cleanup, uh, you know, uh, participating in social justice initiatives where you're, you're uh, engaged in, uh, in uh, shedding light on, on inequality, but, you know, participating in, in uh, building the, uh, the economics of neighborhoods that are, dis uh, uh, that are less favored out. All powerful ways of, of exchanging and building up personal social capital. Um, both communities and economies are based in belief. I'm going to loop back. Remember what I said earlier? One of the biggest advantages to this whole community building social world we're getting into is actually economic. Well, think of what I just said. If reputation weighs so heavily in terms of value, and if intangibles weigh so heavily, and if so many of the products that we're developing, all the services we're developing now, are going to be oriented around access to data and information. You know, building strong communities that share information, that communicate together, that are in constant conversation with government and with, one, with citizens of one another, is also a way of unleashing economic prosperity that isn't even imagined right now. There is an industry waiting to be built to service those conversations, to provide those data. Okay? But to feel they belong, people need to believe they belong. And that's where the relationship between government, particularly municipal government, think about it. City conversations are all about people understanding where they fit in. Fit in with one another, fit in within their neighborhood, fit in within that larger imaginary space, which is the city as a whole. So, how do you do that? Well, you do it through communication, you do it by, like I said earlier, to bring the social media example back, not only through face-to-face -face -face links, which is fantastic, but also through paying attention to the hashtag. That, like I said, that poetry of the everyday that, that, that people are, are composing as they contribute to the virtual city. So it's the real city and the virtual city working together, built, being built together. How does community management work? Well, it enables people to participate within their means. You can't ask someone to participate beyond their means. You can only say to someone, participate as much as you like, whatever you're comfortable with, and then you can try to build that envelope out. If you, as soon as you throw someone in at the deep end, it's sink or swim, and people do not like that, that, that feeling, right? And, and it's not fair either, right? Folks want to participate at, at, at their level of comfort. And then, then they build out more. It's like, you know, a cat goes and a cat puts her, her paw in the water, right? And sees, sees, sees what it's like, and then if, if it's okay, then maybe she'll venture to swim across the river. But if she feels there's a big current, no way she's going to swim across the river, all right? Um, Trust is built on mutual respect. We heard earlier the idea of, of netiquette, you know, the idea of respectful conversation that, uh, where both sides are engaged in a good, good will, good faith fashion. That's essential in community management, right? And the person who's managing the community has to, has to be really aware of the fact that everybody has to be participating in good faith. People have to be good listeners. The city has to be a good listener. Citizens have to be good listeners. Everybody has to listen to one another. And um, 
not just selective listening, where you hear the, 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 the points that you want, not ambush listening, where you're listening to that one point you want so you can attack, right? Not, uh, not uh, um, you know, insulated listening, where you're, you're only hearing one, one version of things. Really open informational listening, right? Or critical listening. So, and that's something that, that's a relationship building exercise on both sides, both sides of a, of a, of, of, of a coin. You know, uh, city on one side, citizens on the other. Citizens to one another as well. And members of government to one another, right? Avoid a sense of entitlement. As soon as you develop a sense of entitlement in community, and if, if there's no single motivating factor, like a profit, profit motive or something like that, you're in trouble, right? Because as soon as someone says, listen to me because I deserve it, um, others will start feeling turned off. Action beats awareness every time. You, uh, the way you build communities by getting people to act. You know, you want people to like each other. Make them, make them go through an experience together. You want people to, and we've all experienced this. You know, you meet people, but it's not until you do the icebreakers or until you have your little round table that you start to, to, to bond and form a small, tiny community, micro community that you have that much yeah, around each table. But action is necessary. You have people have to act to feel part of things. Um, be yourself. Now, you know, a lot of people say you have to be authentic to build community. You have to have a really... We had a conversation about this in, in, in our program, uh, MCM program, about a couple weeks ago. Is it really that you're being authentic? Are you really telling the authentic, your personally authentic view on, on, on whatever social problem you're talking about? Or are you just being consistent? And, and I think that the answer is probably not authenticity. It's about being a consistent self, you know? And that's, that, that's for the city as well. Because the, you know, the authentic you isn't necessarily consistent. <laughs> and the authentic you isn't necessarily always in a good mood, right? So the, in, in, in the bad, the tug of war between authenticity and consistency, I say consistency wins it every time. Right? Uh, and you know, of course, allow other people the same courtesy. Communicating clearly, clarity is important in relationship building. If you play games with people and, and, and pretend, you know, change tacks all the time so they can't predict your behavior, they're not going to really want to enter into community with you. They're not going to like you. We, we, are, we are our friends' friends because we can predict their behaviors. You know, you like people whose behaviors are familiar to you. You can say, well, you know, I, I have a sense of how they're going to react to this. You trust them. Like I said earlier, enforced etiquette, right? Um, community building is dependent on mutual respect. Avoid bike shedding. I like this term. Does anybody know the term bike shedding? No, it's a good one. It's a, it comes from the sort of online community world. And what it is, is the idea of not letting people obsess about minor details and, and ruin relationships because of it. So, you know, this happens a lot on discussion boards where somebody will dive into a, 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 the minutia of a, of a tiny piece of policy that the city has, has promoted, a city has promoted. And then tempers flare, people are, are disagreeing with something really small, and relationships are damaged, right? Effective community management doesn't let that happen, right? But that also means a sort of commitment on the part of citizens and on the part of constituents that, that, that they're going to try to avoid bike shedding as much as they can, right? And that's a good faith thing. I mean, it's like, it's like you're, at a cock, you know, you're at a cocktail party. Social media is kind of like a cocktail party. You're at a cocktail party or you're at a, a coffee party and there, there are people arguing about a specific point that somebody had brought up about a baseball game. And you, you were kind of enjoying the, let's say, okay, sorry, key point. People were watching a baseball game. Um, so, so, you know, they're, they're watching a baseball game and people are arguing about a specific pitcher's style and, and the way he, that pitcher had interacted with a fan, I don't know, a week ago, right? And they're really getting into it. It turns everybody in the place off if that is permitted to continue and continue and continue if they start getting all heated up, right? And where everybody was enjoying themselves watching the ball game together, it ends up being something that people want to avoid in the future and they want to avoid one another. So, so you know, Avoiding, of allowing people to focus in and, and obsess about specific points is important. Governance. 
One of my last points here. So, what does government governance of community depend on? It depends on clear, clear communication and making sure that the channels are open. Um, it means fostering a culture of inclusion and discussion of members with governing bodies. People have to be in conversation to be governed in community. You can't avoid it. They have to be in conversation with one another, and they have to be in conversation with government. Right? Now, are, are they already doing it? Are, are our citizens already doing that? Sure they are. Right? They're doing that by, by you know, using, using all the traditional means, and that's fantastic, and that's, that's working. But what's happened is that this new world of all those traditional media becoming social, shoot, even televisions becoming social through, through Netflix and other things, right? Um, the speed at which the conversation develops and the quantity of quality interactions that folks want with one another and with, with the city is changing, right? So, governing community when people are writing, writing in or phoning in is one thing. Governing community when people are constantly communicating with one another in a public way and with you in a public way and with, with, with bureaucrats and with political staff and whatnot in a public way, totally different ballgame, right? It's, it's, it's something that requires the same sort of TLC that we give to our individual relationships to make sure that they're healthy. You know, it's funny. You build this relationship with someone. Imagine this. Imagine you build this relationship with someone. You charm them. They're, they're, they, they think you're great. You have all these things in common. You're all excited. You become super friends. You hang out together. It's awesome. And then you say, well, okay, that relationship is now sealed, it's done, it's very good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it, press pause, then I'm gonna move on to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charm the next person. So you do and you charm them, and three weeks later, that person thinks you're awesome, and you're having this great conversation, and you're sharing things, and you're bearing your souls, and then you're like, okay, that's done, I'm gonna go back and check on number one. Are they still there in the real world? No. They're gone, they're long gone. Right? In fact, they probably are angry with you and want nothing more to do with you. Because you, you, you put on the, the charm offensive and then you, you neglected them. Right? So you, can, you can't take people for granted in, uh, when you're governing communications. Uh, uh, governing community that's based on, on, on constant conversation. So how do you do it? Well, you have to seek to inspire, to motivate and enthuse community members based on future opportunities and the openness of your governance. I mean, look at the examples of what Toronto and Calgary were doing earlier. Some great stuff there, you know? Inclusive, engaging, exciting things, right? Um, crowdsourcing ideas for how to make the city better. Um, including people in, 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 in neighborhood improvement projects. Uh, making public consultations more available and easier to navigate, and how to get there, attaching them to a map. Simple things. Simple things that, that take the, the virtual world and tie it down to the real world, but where the end product is a far bigger city than what you would have if you were exclusively virtual or exclusively just walking around in the pavement. Okay? Last thing is you have to provide clear objectives, right? Clear objectives. If you don't provide clear objectives, and as was mentioned earlier, clear processes and, and clear input points, not gonna happen. It's like that seduction I talked about earlier, the charm offensive, you include people, and then, oh, by the way, there's no, there's no mechanism for you to continue, right, to be included past this one session, whatever it is. Not something that can work, not sustainable. So provide clear objectives, and finally a mature approach to conflict and deadlocks. But that also means that there's a social contract, that folks who are involved in the community, in the real world, and in the, the virtual world, agree to a goodwill social contract. Um, that there will be some kind of way of, uh, you know, resolving conflict, and people will try to do that in the same way 
that they try to, that we all try to resolve conflict in our everyday lives, in our everyday relationships, right? The only challenge with digital communication, of course, is that there's that permanent history of interactions. I mean, quite frankly, all the people I've argued with, not hard to forgive them because I've forgotten what we argued about. <laughs> not because I'm dumb, just, just, just because that's what happens, right? We, we forget and then we forgive, right? Or we forgive and then we forget, but I think it's actually kind of chicken and egg. But here, the, the, the one challenging thing is that you don't have the, the forget part. So people have to be vigilant about what they, what they share, how they share it, how they, how they participate in other people's lives in both the real world and the social world. So that brings us to our second set of questions. And, you know, if we could look at these and talk about them in our groups again, Hamilton has a really engaged and passionate citizenry. I can tell you this. I mean, I did my uh, doctorate at the University of Toronto and I spent some time in, in Europe as well, in, in France while I was doing my, my, my studies. I also, uh, uh, I was born in Toronto. I grew up in King City. So I also uh, spent some time in Eastern Quebec, Maritime Quebec. I've been around a little bit, right? And I've never been in a place where the citizens are more passionate, more aware, and more knowledgeable about, about their civic life than here in Hamilton. And that's an awesome thing. It's, it's a powerful thing. Um, however, it can also be something that um, requires a lot of TLC, right? Because when you know a lot about one another, and when you have history, those relationships are pretty deep set, right? And pretty powerful. And, and they're already there. So if you're seeking to build a community and to build the city out virtually and, 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 and on, you know, on the street every day, you have to have that in mind. So I'd like you to think about that first question in your groups. You know, how, can this, how, can, how do you think this can be amplified through community building efforts? that the city might need in the virtual and physical worlds, right? How can that already passionate thing be uh, put, be mobilized, right? In, in a productive, constructive way. What do you think is a successful community building effort that the city's already engaged in? You don't have to go into great detail, you can just write, write, write the name of it down, right? Maybe a point about why you think it's what, what valuable. I think we already heard one about, about the Beasley neighborhood. Why do you think the, and finally, how do you think a community building effort on the part of the city could enhance one aspect of city life? Not all aspects, not scattershot, one specific aspect. Okay? Something to think about. And finally, what's an example of, of, of a community building project you think could be implemented fruitfully in Hamilton? I know that's a tall order to kind of put you on the spot kind of thing. If, if you don't have any thoughts about it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but really, do try to answer the first three questions. If you have something, a, a great idea for the fourth one, go for it. But don't, don't, feel, don't feel bad if you're signing on it. Okay, so I'll let you get into your groups. And, oh, we're doing all the time. So, uh... Oh, no, totally. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, um... Remember, it's HD. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a really, I don't know if we have a different approach for other people, but, um, and this is not to, and a great view, but I think the approach to this, we, we feel like we were lectured at, this is a, a lecture, it wasn't uh, an engagement, and I think that bothers a lot of us because we came here, I mean, the parents said, you know, they say, you know, exploring new ways to improve communication between government and citizens, and all we need is to explore the city of Calgary and the city of Toronto. And I think, or we think, that that is, uh, that really exploring new ways. Um, another thing is, like, what are the actual ideas? Like, what is going to come out of this? We just, you know, we've spent all this time going through this, you know, we're going to be on in three hours. What's going to come out of this? I sort of asked you that question earlier, but I think we need something tangible. We're going to have something that we can point to and say, we did this. So that's one thing. Um, someone here was part of the, the website um, uh, consultation, and they said this is basically the same thing, and nothing came of that. And so they feel very much that this was, uh, you know, more of a PR than the actual uh, engagement consultation. Um, I'm sure if any of you... Oh yeah, so just a new method and so on. Uh, we just didn't feel like that 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 was discussed. Um, 
And there's a final point here, and maybe this is it, to me, the ask not told. And, and this just comes down to this again, is that we thought we were going to uh, be discussing relays, and now what has come at least to this point has just been, do we like Toronto or do we like Calgary? And if Hamilton's so engaged, then we should have our own way. We don't need to look at, well, we can look at other people's, but we should be, you should be asking us how we should do it, how we prefer to do it, not telling us Toronto or Calgary. And I think that's it. Oh, that's great. Thank you for the feedback. Actually, well, it isn't about telling. It's, a, it's about just presenting two really different ways of doing it and then seeking feedback through the process and, and uh, seeking new ways of thinking about uh, community building and um, building out the virtual and the real city that are Hamilton-centric and Hamilton-specific. And I think the very fact that, that people are questioning the process is fantastic, right? Because, I mean, that is in essence, you know, direct feedback on something that's just, that, 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 that's been organized and, and that um, uh, was done in good faith and the criticisms in good faith and goodwill as well. So it's, it's, it's really well taken and I appreciate that. And I also share your, your um, idea about, about deliverables and about um, a, a plan going forward. Um, so thank you, thank you for your comments, it's great. Who's, who's next? Oh, here. Alright, so uh, we would question if less than 40% of us voted in this whole action is how many HGRS is. And it gets back to your definition of community. Uh, Maybe very active on social media, but whether that action, whether that talk is translated into action in our community, it's also up for discussion. Uh, in terms of what's working, the pan and district. Got high marks. I think mean, that's something that uh, we should look at as a community. In terms of shared vision, I think there's one there. It says that everyone's being heard, everyone has a voice, and that there are hard deadlines to this project. So it doesn't get into let's just sit and talk and talk and talk. So high marks for the pain Thank you very much. Our group uh, spent a bit of time just getting to know each other, uh, which was which was good. Um, we were uh, sort of starting to address some of the points. I don't know if we covered them all, but um, uh, one idea that came up was that uh, Hamilton has engaged uh, citizens citizenry, and uh, one point that was made was that when we have protests or gatherings at City Hall. Maybe we could have the mayor or somebody come out, especially if they know ahead of time, to address these people so that they feel that, you know, there is uh, some ears that their voice is falling on. Because I know in Hamilton it seems to be a lot of fragmented groups that sort of seem to be searching for some kind of validation, some kind of uh, a voice. So I, I feel that, uh, or we feel that that could be uh, good in, in helping to uh, create a good flow of communication. Um, participatory budgeting was something that we thought was uh, fairly successful. Ward 1 and Ward 2 are doing that. And uh, we felt that that was uh, a, a really good way of engaging uh, citizens. And we felt that that was uh, something that we need more of, where we can have some uh, sense of uh, engagement. Um, as far as the rest of it, um, you're talking about the uh, Martin and Tiffany area. Or the, uh, uh, I know that the city was a little disappointed in how the stadium thing went, but I feel that this is a big area of the city right now, and the waterfront development, I really feel that uh, you know, the city should try and keep engaging the citizens as much as possible, because they're the ones that are going to be end users of these properties. So I think that's about as far as we got. Ward 1 uh, community engagement. Success. Do you want to speak to the Ward 1 community? I'd rather John spoke John? to it. John, just <laughs> speak to that one. He's the one who raised it. Well, I, I raised this. I, I live in Ward 2. But I'm very impressed with what Ward 1 is doing. The, uh, any contact that is made to either Dale or, or the or the caddy, 
any contact at all is noted. That particular person is on the list, uh, unless he was to be deleted. That person is in kept continuous contact with what the ward uh, needs of them, what the ward interests are, what they, and what the counselor is doing. So they, they feel there's a real closeness. And it, it works. I wish it, uh, oh, anyway, I'll let that go. Thank you. community building and noted the casino, the sta stadium debate, board of education. All of these were uh, controversial issues uh, that encouraged uh, conversation and eventually brought people together. And uh, so those have been the successful ones. But there's also been less controversial ones like community gardens, things that cross over from the virtual to the physical worlds. Um, I think the other thing that we uh, noted and discussed is that there are a lot of communities in Hamilton that are quite separated. They're separated geographically, economically, and yet they may have things in common or things that they should be uh, discussing with each other. So whatever we do, we need to make sure there's room for discussion across communities as well as within communities. Over here, comments. What was uh, most uh, striking in our conversation to begin with is that our group could think of any community building engagements that we knew the city was involved in. I see people nodding their heads. Unfortunately for me, I'm saying the people who work at the city. So as I started naming, The city is actually involved in a lot of those things. It's just that the general public, people like me, don't know, don't know that they're involvement, that they're involved at all. And in terms of the word engaged, well, what is what does engaged mean to the city? Does it mean funding it? And is that enough? Great, great, great points. Let's go over here. So, um, I'm new to Hamilton, so I can't speak out of a great deal of personal experience, but uh, one, of the, one of the things that our group talked about in terms of amplifying the engagement of citizenry was again the, the importance, it's a, it's a general consideration, the importance of matching the virtual engagement with face to face engagement. And again, we, we refer to that the example of what they're doing with the Beasley Community Association, matching very, very active web presence with also kind of an active outreach to people for whom that's not the medium by which they receive their information. Another thing we talked about that we thought would be important, and it, it echoes what some of the other tables have said, is this is what us learned about it online, and we had a question about what the follow-up is going to be. It, will there be actually a successful kind of incremental process to have an ongoing conversation uh, so that you you don't just have a conversation and then it ends, but you have an iterative process that goes somewhere and, and builds a sense of, of investment as it goes. When we were talking about uh, examples of successful community building um, efforts that the city has been involved in previously, some of the, 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 the main example that we talked about that, that no other group has mentioned was getting uh, the buy-in of the community for the recycling and composting program. One of the things, another thing that we talked about is particularly important and connected to the, the idea of um, trying to enhance face-to-face -face contact with people is, is the city, um, or the importance of walkable neighborhoods and focusing on what kinds of things will make the neighborhoods walkable uh, as a way to increase interaction among people and commerce on city streets and so forth. So it's, it seemed to us that that was an important and valuable thing that the city could be doing and, and, and asking people in the neighborhoods, particularly in the denser urban neighborhoods, 
what they'd like to see to make their cities more, more walkable and more hospitable to people who want to live in a, on an urban scale. Uh, we, one further thing that we talked about was, for example, the discussions that are, that are happening now around the James North Station, that the city has an interesting opportunity to really involve the, the local neighborhood. There's a lot of anxiety about what it will mean for the immediate neighborhood. And so there's a real opportunity there to have a, a meaningful uh, process that sort of seems to have gotten off to a good start. And the final point that we talked about, which others have mentioned, is uh, Hamiltonians may be passionate, but they can also be vicious and, uh, or, uh, or something like that. And the example of the fight over the stadium and where the new stadium was going to go was, was given as an example of that. So just the importance of trying to maintain some civil bounds in the discourse. Great, thank you very much. A real diversity of points there. So we had a conversation that focused on a couple of things. One is engagement between meetings. Uh, we talked about really breaking tasks into smaller chunks, keeping small groups of people working on some activities, uh, showing some momentum, getting back together to sort of chart progress. And one of the ways that the virtual and the physical can come together is there are lots of tools that can help you in the process of doing stuff to keep connected electronically so we don't always have to go through the exercise of scheduling and booking meeting space, which tends to slow things down. And, and there was a desire, as the two of us chatted, to, uh, to see more activity happen and break activity down, not always into 25-year master plans, but into those smaller chunks of work where we can see progress, reflect on progress, and course correct. Uh, an idea that came up about where we might uh, find some commonality and, and move forward as a community on the area of older adults. And uh, it's an issue that doesn't just affect older adults, it's actually affecting other generations as well. More and more people these days are, are caring for family members. Uh, and the stress of, of that and some of the lack of information and some of the lack of clarity of who does what as, uh, as, as our population ages may be an area where we as a community can come together and support a very large section of our population but not just those folks, actually the folks that care for them and are involved in the work as well. So we talked a little bit about a strategy and how we might come together as a community around, uh, around a senior strategy, older adults strategy, uh, which is an idea floating around uh, the city and has come forward from a number of groups already. Thank you very much. And uh, that's good. So in answer to the first question, thought that it was a very broad, broad topic, so we decided to uh, probably answer that through the rest of uh, Some good examples, uh, our colleagues over there have already mentioned the participatory budgeting, um, was also said to be a very good one. Neighborhood action plans, um, some enhancements, we already know that park improvements and uh, the improvements of, of meeting spaces are going on, but we need to see more of it. Uh, another one of the enhancements was uh, complete streets, which goes back to what you were saying a moment ago. And uh, I'm kind of surprised it hasn't been said before, but of course open data, which will play into things like your mapping, your transit, and all of that other goodness. Um, I think that is, is definitely a must. As far as community building projects, things that the city can uh, can take on, civic education for young students. We are, uh, you know, you said we're turning up what, less than 40% uh, for our, our voting, so we need to engage our young people. Citywide participatory budgeting. So take that participatory budgeting from the boards of the various ridings and take it up a notch. Uh, lastly, project and communication integration. Again, going back to what you were saying about um, having people meeting up and then having the communication follow up. We've heard meetings and meetings going on, but nothing ever comes out of it. I know that I signed up for the web one, couldn't make it, and asked for feedback on what happened. So I'm going to, and that was almost two months ago. So um, that definitely needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent time, Paul. And honestly, the the, uh, 
dose of healthy skepticism is also a, a uh, sobering and, and, and keep, keep, a, keep us honest type of, type of thing, which I think is necessary in, in, in any kind of open public conversation, right? Um, the, uh, the fact that once you question the process or, or question outcomes, as we heard that at several tables, I think is, uh, is important because that's actually how relationships are built. You know, we don't enter into a new relationship and say, you know, I love you all to pieces, all together, all completely now, right? It, it's also, it's a, a question of building trust and, and, and winning people over. Um, and you do that through actions and sustained actions, right? Um, and I, so I think that um, that's, uh, those are powerful comments and I, I really appreciate that they're brought, brought forward and, and put, on the, put on the table. Um, one thing that, that is uh, certainly a tangible outcome of this evening that's um, going to be a permanent and sustained uh, effort on the part of the city is, is actually launching a component of, 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 the, of, of the social media community building effort. And that is actually starting uh, the, you know, the city of Hamilton's first tweet tonight right? and launching it. So if you, if you have a look at your... Uh, at your uh, uh, devices, you know, in, in the next few moments, you know, you'll see that that, that, we, that's, that, that part of the um, evening is a tangible reality. So, you know, the city of Hamilton has issued its first tweet, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I, I invite you to go have a look. Yep. What's that? <laughs> well, so the Hamon hashtag. <laughs> oh, you're actually asking me what the what the handle is? Oh, it's at City Hamilton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so, so uh, there you go, Hamilton's first week. Um, and that's something that, you know, well, that's a, a, a medium that's been open, a conversational medium that's going to be sustained and, and something that uh, says that the city is open for conversation. So that being said, I thought that we could circle back actually to our original point, which is actually, uh, when I put the roadmap up, I said that we'd end with a short conversation of limitations and deliverables. And to do that, I'd actually like to welcome Paul back to the stage, and he'll talk to you about what, what, going, what steps are going forward, what to expect.